that literally was my trip. There's a lot of love in life and there's so much focus on romantic love. I love it. <laughs> I freaking love it. A friend of mine, his name is Marty and we call him Medieval Marty. Medieval Marty often says that the real theme of the Lord of the Rings trilogy is about the relationship between Sam and Frodo. And then naturally I got to think about what can happen if we see love not just as a romantic mm -hmm. thing. It's easy to think that it's all about romance. How much is missed if that is the only type of love that matters. Oh my God, I'm going to be in tears. I was just sitting there in front of each of my girlfriends at the time to see them 30 years later, but to recognize the impact that they had on me. Their love was so real and so pure that they took the risk of our friendship and that saved my life. In your being a loving being, that is exactly what makes you lovable. Men in general struggle to tell their men friends that they love them. Tell them if you have the opportunity, tell them. It's not always about romantic love. Think, seek out, remember the love of friends. Welcome to Simply Enough. This is Zachary and Elizabeth, and thanks for tuning in. If you're liking our podcast, we'd love it if you'd share with your friends and family. And then rate and review to raise our visibility and spread the message of enoughness. We love you. And remember, you are simply enough. Just as you are. Period. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Simply Enough. I'm Mr. Zachary Linnert. And I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ignacio. And I have the pleasure of kicking us off today. And listeners, I want to invite you in on a little secret of mine that Dr. Ignacio already knows, but I <laughs> was on a plane uh, a couple, about last week, and I like to uh, load up my personal devices with movies that I've downloaded just in case, you know, the in-flight entertainment isn't working or there isn't a movie or something that I'm interested in watching. I will have these go-to movies that I love, um, that are ready. And the Lord of the Rings trilogy is, are, are some movies that I always have. If I, if I can download them, I always make sure that they're there. I love those movies. Um, mm -hmm. I love the, the grandness and how epic they are. Um, but I also love the relationships that are focused on in the in the in the movies and that's really where i want to jump in today so i've shared on the podcast before that i was fortunate enough to study abroad and i lived with um, a friend of mine his name is marty and we call him medieval marty because he used to work at medieval times and medieval marty is probably one of the most incredible people i know and so i'm going to give you a little shout out marty and uh, I'm going to let you know that you were spoken of so highly in this episode. But anyway, Medieval Marty has a tremendous amount of love for Tolkien's books mm -hmm. and often says that the real theme of the Lord of the Rings trilogy is about the relationship between Sam and Frodo. Mm -hmm. And this relationship, truly male friendships and what they went through with each other, right? Frodo obviously having, you know, this task of having to destroy the ring and Sam's job to support Frodo in that is one of the major themes of, of this movie. And Marty told me that back, you know, in 2001, when we studied abroad. And I, I think about that every time I watch the movies, mm -hmm. I was reminded uh, this past week when I was on the plane and I was watching the movie at, at how right Marty is. And the ups and downs that Frodo and Sam go through. And I don't want to make this podcast about, you know, like some kind of dissection of the movie itself. But with this lens, I was able to, to really focus in on the ebbs and the flows of Sam and Frodo's relationship. And yet how tight and true that love is between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And then naturally I got to think about my friend, Marty, and, and how grateful I am for him in my life and what can happen if we see love, not just as a romantic mm -hmm. thing, right. But expand it and see what can happen when there's truly love in different forms. And in this case, love with my friend, Marty and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the relationship that can happen between men um, in this regard is something that I was struck by when I watched this movie. And yes, you know, there are the battles and it's epic and there are eagles and like all these things, but at the core is a tremendous story about love. And that's what hit me. And that's what I, where I want to kick off today's episode, just really from Lord of the Rings 
to Sam and Frodo and their friendship and the love that can happen there and what that love looks like compared to love in other forms. Mm -hmm. Hold my beer because there's like <laughs> so much to say about this. And by the way, so I love Lord of the Rings as well. Um, I'm just going to throw one little thing. Um, funny that it's all about Frodo, but it's not because really Sam's the hero. Just going to throw that out there. <laughs> just going to throw that out there that you find the hero when you least expect it. And actually sometimes overlook the hero because you're so used to looking at a, a, a certain you know, a certain person or a certain yeah, characteristic. Yeah. Anyway, um, I it, like if you think about or, or look at, um, my God, how we're going down this theme of like fantasy movies, but Harry Potter, I mm -hmm. mean, yes, you know, right. Hermione and Ron, they ended up romantically, you know, entangled, but, but as a whole, like it's the friendship and the love amongst, you know, Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Um, the Avengers, you know, I, I love the Avengers and Marvels. That is uh, a love of, of friendship. And it is so funny that love is almost a trigger word where, you know, it, it it's people think, or it, it's easy to think that it's all about romance and that's the only type of love that exists. And how much is missed if that is the only pursuit, if you will, or, or that's the only type of love that, that matters. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, that, that makes me think of, you know, one of my favorite shows, everybody <laughs> get the like drinking game. I, know, I, really... I mentioned Schitt's <laughs> Creek or Ted Lasso, everybody take a drink because it really, I, I, I know I mentioned it so often. Thank you everybody for your understanding. But so Ted Lasso, they, you know, they had their, Sorry, they had their season finale, arguably their series finale. Mm -hmm. My heart Aww. is broken. Um, but for, you know, three seasons and especially the final season, there's a lot of, you know, talk on blogs and articles and, and that kind of thing in terms of will the two major characters get together, um, Ted Lasso and Rebecca regardless of whatever happens between them at the end, you know, do they or don't they? Do we pitch entirely the past three seasons of the development of their of mm. their deep friendship, respect, love for each other that way? You know, like uh, when Harry met Sally, for those who might have seen <laughs> that that movie, and it's you know decades old now, so there's no spoiler alert I have to give. But yeah, sure, Harry and Sally get together at the end, and it's such a you know, joy and sigh mm -hmm. of relief, but that's not to negate at all, you know, the, the, how they were there for each other and the friendship that developed throughout the movie. Um, I, I feel, sorry, I just can't help but laugh, but like, you're an academic, I'm an academic. And here we're talking about like <laughs> pop culture. Um, but you brought it back to I your did. real life in terms of, you know, medieval Marty. And I just came back um, from uh, Washington, D.C., which is where I went to um, undergrad and med school and residency. So that was literally my my second home, my home away from home. I'm now back in Hawaii, but I spent 13 years, um, you know, in in D.C. And I happened to miss my 30th, that's how old I am, everybody, my 30th college <laughs> reunion by a week uh, because I had to be in DC the week following and I, I couldn't get there in time for the, the actual reunion. But fortunately, a, a number of my friends do still live in DC. So when I was up there um, a week after reunion, I still was able to meet up with um, some of my friends and I met up with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, and Oh my God, I'm going to be in tears already because, um, you know, we talk about how there are, you know, friends that, you know, you haven't seen in so long and you pick back right up, you know, where you left off. And we definitely did that in terms of fun and reminiscing. Um, but what really struck me is how our friendship um in terms of the depth of friendship. So not just the lighthearted fun and the reminiscing of the good old days, but actually right where we are now and what's going in our lives now, you know, our struggles, our heartbreaks, our trials, our tribulations, um, how that got 
quickly picked up, you know, right where we left off. And I literally was just sitting there in front of each of my girlfriends at the time, just thinking how grateful I am for them. And from that gratitude, the recognition of how much I love them. And I, I just, I'm just so I'm getting in tears and I'm just, I am, I, I love them and I'm in love with them because I'm just so grateful for this precious gift of this, this, love that exists in our friendship. And I mean, to see them 30 years later, uh, but to recognize the impact that they had on me 30 years ago and how their impact carries on. And then the ability um, to, to remind them of that, if they didn't realize the impact on, on me, um, that was such a special gift. And it, it doesn't, though I talk about, I know I'm rambling a lot because there's just so much that I want to say about these women, you know, though I say that we, that college for me was 30 years ago and yay, hooray, our friendship has lasted, mm -hmm. you know, this long. And even in not speaking to each other for years, but we, but we pick right back up. So I, I do consider this a 30 year friendship. It's amazing how actually, you know, it doesn't take 30 years to create and cement a friendship and and create and cement and recognize the love that can be there between friends. I'm being a little vague. Um, specifically, what I uh, was thanking um, my friends about uh, was my freshman year. So we had only known each other for less than a year, and they saved my life. Mm -hmm. And the way that I mean, and I mean that sincerely is, is so I was a cheerleader for Georgetown and, you know, it was, it was um, we were co-ed team. So um, they're all girls now, but back then it was co-ed team. We did the tumbling, we did the stunting, you know, and so get, you know, we, we, we do the acrobatic stunts, we get thrown in the air. So part of it was, is that we got weighed um, on the scale, the, the women, uh, we got weighed on the scale weekly. And that did a number on me. And so I thought that I was fooling everybody by, by, by midterm or mid semester, uh, because, um, I, you know, became bulimic and I thought that I was fooling everybody. Um, and I was, you know, um, nobody knew. And then I was like, hiding it well and that kind of thing. But yeah, being weighed weekly, like truly did a number on me. Um, and I, I thought that I actually got quote good at being bulimic. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> claiming <laughs> something like that? But yeah, I was like, Oh, nobody knows. And I can, you know, make myself purge on a dime so easy. And, um, my friends who, again, this has been less than a year. We, we were freshmen. They um, uh, waited for me in my room and it looked like we were all going to hang out in my room before, you know, a night on the town. And so they are all gathered there. And uh, one of my friends was kind of the spokesperson. And this was the friend that I um, got a chance to say thank you to. Um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, but one of my friends was kind of the, the spokesperson and said, basically, you know, we know, and this has to stop. Do you, you know, we love you. Do you not love yourself? Like, you know, what are you doing? You know? And she started crying because she was so worried about me that she started crying and she was like, I'm so afraid and I don't know what to do. And I don't know what to say to you, but, but I'm so afraid for you. And I love you so much. And I don't want you doing this to yourself. And I, 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 I just keep going back to this. The, we knew each other for less than a year and these group of young women um, took the risk because I could have given them you know, all the, the double middle finger and, you know, made my own friends or, you know, lash out at them. And their love was so real and so pure. And their concern for me out of that love was so real and so pure that they took the risk of our friendship by having this intervention. And that saved my life, literally. Like, I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. That 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 forced me to confront 
myself. That was probably the very beginning of my journey of simply enough, if you know what I mean. <laughs> my my 30 year journey <laughs> since then of my simply enoughness. Um, but uh, yeah, I digress a lot. I'm so sorry, but that I digress because words fail me. And it's ironic that this is a podcast. And so podcast is all about words and sharing of words, but words fail me because of my gratitude for the love of and the love from my friends. Mm -hmm. It's not always about romantic love and it's mm -hmm. not about coupling. And it's like, don't, don't miss the boat, everybody. Um, if, if you're feeling alone or if you're feeling lonely, think, seek out, remember the love of friends. Thank you for sharing that story. Thank you for sharing that story with us as an opportunity for us to then reflect on the people that have showed up for us from a place of pure love for us and for your vulnerability in sharing that as well. Um, and then if I could, because I know you now, forgive me for getting emotional, but I want to thank those friends. And I hope they listen to this episode because I have you in my life. And if that love hadn't propelled them to take that risk and to be there for you, who knows where you would be and whether or not you'd be in my life now. And the blessings and the gift and the love that you have given me are directly related to the love that they gave you. And so whoever they are, I hope they listen because I want you to know that your willingness to take that risk and to, to lean into that love allowed this love to exist in my life. <laughs> so I just need to say that as well. Um, from which then, we both benefit because I, you know, I, I benefit from, from our friendship that has become family mm -hmm. that you are to me. Yeah. You know, you, you, you brought up earlier the idea of in Ted Lasso, there's kind of this like public push to like, we want to see them together, right? Like that's the storyline, Ross and Rachel, we want, you know, we want them <laughs> to end up as a couple. And yet I think, um, you know, I think about even like silly examples, forgive me, of like Sex in the City or even in Frozen, which is more like sibling love, but the, the, the opportunity for Hollywood, for stories, et cetera, to, to push us to champion other forms of love and how those other forms of love deeply fulfill us. I mean, mm -hmm. Dr. Ignacio, you are overcome with emotion. And I think that emotion is not unique to you. I think if we all dig in, we can, we can think of those people whose love for us is so strong that words fail us. You have helped me recognize and identify that with me. It's kind of unreal how your story just flooded me in the best way. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? To think of mm -hmm. the people that I could name off that showed up in key moments in my life, purely from a place of friendship, love, deep care for each other. Um, that's a good feeling. And sorry, I'm, I, I'm getting emotional. Don't be Thank sorry. You. Don't be sorry. No, no, no. Um, one thing too, I'm so, I'm so grateful, you know, to, to the good Lord above that. Yes, we are still friends 30 years later and, and are there for each other. I've also come to learn myself to kind of uh, stop scorekeeping meaning, oh, well, they showed up for me back then and now they're not, um, but I show up for them. Well, what kind of friends are they? Um, when I learned the phrase friends for a season, friends for a reason, friends for life. Yes, there are those, you know, for whom I'm so grateful that I really, truly believe and sense that we will be friends for life. That doesn't negate if during a season or you know, for a reason now, different from real friends, deal friends, sure, or like right. it's, 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 you're, you're being used and, it, and it's a yeah. transactional friendship, but you know, friends for a season, friends for a reason, if that friendship meant something, then you can still take with you, um, the beauty that was that friendship back then, even if it hasn't been maintained or perpetuated, you still get to, you know, pluck the jewels from that crown and carry it with you um, how you want to. Yeah. Um, I would also add to it, something you were saying earlier is going to be my invitation to our listeners 
tell them if you have the opportunity, tell them. I, I think I'm going to make a big sweep here and say that men in general, I think, struggle to tell their, their men friends that they love them or that they care about them or that they are instrumental in their lives in ways that they maybe can't even quite capture. You said you were, you had the opportunity to tell your friend. Now you may not get that opportunity and that's okay. But if you do have that opportunity, what a beautiful moment to share with another individual. When, even if it's, I love you, just simple as that. It, it is a practice that I have become um, very proud of. I tell everyone that I can, I love them. I tell them all the time because one, I mean it. And two, I just feel like it's an opportunity always worth taking, you know? Amen, amen, amen. Um, so not to get scientific, but let's get a little scientific. So Do it. there are- <laughs> It's certain... a nice balance from the sex in the city, <laughs> Ted Lasso. <laughs> So certain tools to increase one's gratitude in one's life and gratitude has been shown to uh, increase well-being. And one thing is to journal five specific things that you're thankful for um, and not just, you know, the quick things like home food, you know, shelter, educate, like, like very specific things that, that you list out. So that's one um, tool that I actually recommend to not only clients, um, my coaching clients, but even my patients, because um, that has been shown to uh, improve um, surgical outcome uh, and, and decreased uh, pain medication requirements, believe it or not. So anyway, so that's one um, uh, evidence-based outcome tool um, that has been shown to be um, helpful. The other one is um, not only recognizing the gratitude one feels, but then taking the next step and reaching out to a person, whether it is to make a phone call or to write a letter. And so that's what you're talking about in terms of actually reach out and say that you love someone. And um, it might be risky because in, you know, um, <laughs> amongst homophobes, for example, right. and I'm sure it's harder for men than, than women, because, you know, we women, it's not uncommon to tell our girlfriends how much we love each other, but I can imagine how brave that must, um, or courageous that must feel, um, and vulnerable also that how that must feel for a man telling a platonic man that they love them, but do it anyway, because <laughs> I, I can wholeheartedly speak to with my N of one anecdotally, how, uplifting and meaningful and sustaining it is for the person articulating the love and articulating the thanks because this visit back to DC and I, I go back to DC, you know, every year or every other year and I, I see friends, but for whatever reason, this particular trip um, was an opportunity that I took for me to say, thank you. So I said, thank you. And I, I articulated to these girlfriends in specifics, how and what they meant to me. And, and the how is key. That's what I mean by specifics. Like mm -hmm. when you did this for me, this is what it meant. And so I was able to do that for my girlfriends. I also was able, this also is going to bring me to tears. This, this trip was really moving for me to go back to like my second home of DC. I then gathered also, uh, um, uh, I had the opportunity to gather some of my mentors um, and anybody who's heard multiple episodes of Simply Enough know I'm in a male dominated mm -hmm. profession, very alpha male dominated profession. I was the only woman, first woman in so many steps of my career. And um, I'm the first to say that I'm not a male basher though, because I'm a feminist, but I'm not a male basher because because I was the first and because I was the only, I needed men to champion me and I needed men to be supportive of me. And they did more than that. They actually lifted me when I wanted to quit multiple times. And though I have seen these mentors in the past, you know, um, you know, for social reasons and very light, or I'll drop into their clinic to say hi, for whatever reason, I felt compelled to have them all gathered for me to specifically say thank you and why I was saying thank you, you know, so-and-so, okay, George, for example, George, you know, 
uh, my first rotation as an orthopedic surgery resident was with you as my senior. And that was a make it or break it time, George, because if you in any way felt me, made me feel less than I could have quit. But yet, because of how you treated me that very first rotation, that was my entryway, you know, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Lefton, thank you for talking to me in the, in the garage when I was ready to quit. And you told me not to, and, and I, and then also to tell them where I am now, which perhaps externally I may seem or sound successful if you look at my resume, but that where I am now, it's not lost on me where I came from and how where I am now is because of that journey. And I wouldn't even have been able to embark or survive the journey had it not been for them. I had them in tears. I was in tears. Once again, words failed me, but the, the feelings that that engendered was so necessary for me selfishly how it's so funny that it was selfish of me to say thank you to them <laughs> because it meant so much to me. And then the third and final thing, sorry, in terms of, you know, to your point, say thank you, say I love you, is um, I was there in D.C. for a few weeks because actually my son is um, um, doing a, um, a research internship uh, at the um, at the NIH, National Institute of Health, specifically National Cancer Institute at the NIH. And um, so I went up there um, with him and, you know, it is my old stomping grounds. And so I got to revisit Georgetown and revisit my second home through my eyes. But then also in, as we talk about in previous episodes, you know, my, my mixed feelings of heartbreak, seeing, you know, my daughter in college and she is, you know, um, spreading her wings. Well, here I'm witnessing and seeing my son, who's a rising senior in high school, but in this adult atmosphere, doing this, you know, adult job of, of this research, um, paid research internship, and seeing him take advantage of these opportunities and, and seeing him grow. And yet it's breaking my heart again. <laughs> I couldn't help but think of my own parents. And my, um, what they, as these Philippine immigrants in Hawaii, allowing their daughter to go 5,000 miles to DC, like I'm doing with my son, but, uh, and to spread my wings and the sacrifices that they made so that I could have these experiences and I, and I could reminisce and reflect on, on the experiences that I had. I couldn't have had them had they not sacrificed not only their own heartbreak of letting me go, but even, you know, um, concrete hardships. So not just the abstract emotion, but concrete hardships of, of sacrificing in terms of finances and, and all that kind of stuff. So I specifically, upon coming back home to Hawaii, made a point to specifically tell my mom and dad that in witnessing this, uh, and, and experiencing my own journey as a parent, witnessing Gracie, you know, uh, leaving and 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 now having finished uh, uh, her first year in college on the East Coast, and now witnessing my son, knowing what that feels like and knowing what that takes to allow your child to go, I had to thank my parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you know, it comes off the it comes off my mouth all the time in in Filipino um, culture you you greet your parents every day with i love you and, and that kind of thing like you're you're a bad filipino if you don't <laughs> so those wor those words come off almost right. like rote memorization like okay bye mom and dad love you but this time like i made a point of like sitting down and telling them not only that i love them and not only that i thank them but the why of it mm -hmm. so that it really is piercing and penetrating that it's not just words but that there is heartfelt genuine emotion and gratitude behind it and that benefited me doing that so once again it was selfish of me i did it <laughs> selfishly to cuz it made me feel good to say thank you mm -hmm. and to say i love you and that's family love that's mm -hmm. not romantic love either mm -hmm. 
I have so many thoughts. I am going to try to, I'm going to try to be clear about where my brain is right now. Cause I, as you were talking, so many things were pinging for me, um, thinking about just truly, truly loving another person means an, an, an openness to the risk involved. Just saying, I love you, as you talked about earlier and what the, another person's, um, how they respond to that. Uh, you, you almost have to surrender and because you are, for lack of a better way, coming from a selfish place of saying, I need to say this to you. I need, I need to do that. There's an acceptance that the other person will do with it what they do with it. Um, for me, that is, I'm willing to take that risk. I'm willing to take that risk and to lean into the potential connection that can be strong, enforced and re you know, retightened to let that person know how I feel if that means that they have to walk away. And I, and I say that because so many times when I came out, I came out truly to another person because I loved them. And I wanted to share me with them, knowing that there was a possibility that that part of who I was meant that they could walk away. And they did. But the people that stayed reinforced that I am a loving being and I'm a loving being who takes the opportunity to say that, that I love another person, knowing that there might be some losses, but the wins are so worth it that I am gonna, I'm going to take that opportunity every time, every time. So that's like one thought. Yes. And it is in your being a loving being. That's a lot of beings, but the yeah. being matters. <laughs> in your being a loving being, that is exactly what makes you lovable. <laughs> Thank you. No, truly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like, you know, if you want a friend, be a friend. Same thing. In wanting love, be loving. And that's not only what you do, it's who you are. Mm -hmm. Sorry I interrupted. Go mm -hmm. ahead. No, 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 no. I um when you were when you were talking about the 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 practices that can help um bring positivity or can build positivity in one's life journaling. And then also, um, stepping out and, and actually telling somebody else, I want to acknowledge, um, something that I'm working on in my, in my life. And it's kind of the inverse of what you were saying is I have a difficult time receiving when somebody says to me, look, you, you've changed my life. You, you, you know, you took the risk. I have a difficult time with that. I don't know what to do with it. I get all uncomfortable and I get like the willies inside and, and all those things, but you sharing that that isn't and it's selfish. I don't, you know, we, we keep using that word and I feel like it has a pejorative connotation and I don't mean it that way, but that it's truly an opportunity for that other person to say what they want to say. I now can receive that differently. Because I get uncomfortable and I'll be like, but you did this and thank you. And it's, and it's like, no, 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 no. Let's just be in that moment where somebody wants to say, I love you. Thank you for when, how, et cetera, receive that gift. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that to all of you really good. I'm talking to myself here, like <laughs> be in that place where you can acknowledge that you demonstrate it and show, showed love to another individual. And they want you to know what it felt like for them what it meant to them and how it stayed with them. That was my other receiving receiving is definitely key. And it is a part of a loving relationship. It's so funny. Uh, once again, boy, this trip. Um, so one <laughs> thing uh, uh, on, on this trip in to DC, I, um, I have two very special people in my life who happen to be married to each other, uh -huh. but they were special to me in my life separately. And so I find it ironic. I find it amazing, not ironic, but I find it amazing that they found each other and married uh -huh. each other. So one was like, she was like my big sister in undergrad and med school, Tina. I love you, Tina. And then my um, senior resident and chief resident who again, is one of the, the ones who really championed me and I would not be an orthopedic surgeon without him. Um, Chris, they met each other and married each other. So how ironic <laughs> that these two integral people in my life are uh -huh. married to each other. So anyway, so I um, uh, took them out uh, when I was in DC and I um, I chose the restaurant and I, you know, encourage mm -hmm. order this, order this. And, oh, and I will also say, Chris and Tina, if you're listening, you know, this is true. <laughs> when I made the arrangements, I specifically said, 
and this is my treat because they had taken care of me and my son throughout the the time that I was there and continue to take care of my son even after I I came back to Hawaii. So it was really important to me to treat them. And I mean, here I literally was like, ordering all this kind of stuff because, Hey, I'm paying and I want to Filipinos show love through food. So I <laughs> like, I wanted to like have this, you know, smorgasbord of things. And, um, and I want, I, I, I wanted to spoil them because that, again, that's how Filipinos show love. It was the only, like only way that I could. Um, and lo and behold, Chris, that, mother <laughs> um and oh and i even told the waitress ahead of time um the check comes to me the mm-hmm. reservation is under my name which at least in hawaii that's a rule like if the reservation is under yeah. your name you pay like there's no fighting at the table because that's an established thing so i cleared it with the waitress and stuff like that well lo and behold when it came time for the check Chris had already, you know, <gasps> given the credit card and she gave it to him which first of all part of me was kind of like that's a little sexist. Like, why'd you let the guy like, anyway, but, <laughs> but, but the other thing, it was just kind of like, you know, we had a deal. I, like I was like glaring at the waitress who I was actually like loving throughout the dinner. <laughs> but right when she gave me that check, I'm like, now I, now you're on my shit list. And there was like this like joke. Well, Chris thought it was a joking fight, but I was like insistent. And I was like, you have to let me do this. This was a deal. I, I said it ahead of time that I, I, you know, I was going to treat and Tina, you know, and Tina's a strong individual, like, you know, uh, both physically and, and in character. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, she like looked at me and she actually like looked sad for me. And I kept saying to Chris who like kept insisting that no, they're going to pay. I said, you are robbing me from the joy of being able to thank you. And I like was sincere and Tina could tell Tina's my sister. So she could tell <laughs> I was sincere and she understood that yeah. like, you're taking this from me. Like it means so much to me. And it's not because, Oh, I owe you. Cause you did this. And so now I owe you. So now it's my turn. Like it, it viscerally, emotionally, spiritually meant something to me to treat them for this splurge of the dinner. And so not only did it rob me of the joy of that, but then I was even embarrassed because the whole night I was like, order this and order that. And, and I just wish that it could have just been received. Um, And, you know, I I get it. And and the funny thing is I, I I say that as if like, I'm good at receiving. I only have reset. (laughs) I I was going to say, (laughs) (laughs) um, you know, I I've had my uh, battles over the bill before where I insist (laughs) that I pay, but I I recognize more so now than ever um, being gracious in saying, thank you. When somebody wants to give to me. It's such a great example because if we, I'm just going to speak freely about myself. If I am hoping that people will be receiving fully of my love for them, I'm also asking myself to be fully open to receiving love from them. They, they go hand in hand. It is a reciprocal relationship because otherwise it's not love. There's a condition on it, meaning I can take care of you, but you can't take care of me. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm saying right now this out loud because I am, I am, this is a work in progress. Just a couple of weeks ago, a very dear friend of mine, Lacey, I can't thank you enough. She's she's family, was just getting a hold of me. And she's like, Look, I know you're you're going through some stuff. Let me be there for you. You have this tendency to turtle where you just like kind of hibernate and you don't ask for help and you try to take it on your own, but then you end up like distancing yourself from people. And there are people in your life that want to take care of you in the way that you take care of others. That is what love is. And so I think it's a, a perfect excellent example, Dr. Ignacio, because it quite captures that saying that you love somebody else means that you have to be open to receiving the love from them. I, I think it's it's just the way that it is. And yes, part of that means that somebody else has to treat. Somebody else can take care of you. <laughs> somebody yes. else needs to grab the bill, right? Or they need to And it's the their joy. It's, it's and their it's joy. Their, yes. You know, yes. Yeah. Like, is this about love? Is this about friendship like what what was this about well i think it was i think it was a reset i'm going to just say for myself it was a beautiful reset 
in many ways. One, it was an acknowledgement that I am blessed to have true love in my life. And that true love takes on many different forms. Yes. And one of the the forms that often I think gets overlooked, but is such a part of being human is the love that can exist, the platonic love that can exist between two friends or within a family. And the opportunity to, to demonstrate that love by taking risk, by being vulnerable, by stepping in and saying, I see you, I'm worried, I'm nervous, this concerns me, but I love you so much that I'm gonna take the risk that maybe you'll walk away because I love you so much that that risk is worth it. That's the love that we can champion, that we can celebrate because it's so deeply emotional. It cuts directly to who we are as human beings. It's why you shared so many beautiful stories in this episode and why you got so emotional because it is at the core of who we are. And in those opportunities to recognize that love, we also have opportunities to share and tell people and then also receive from others. And that is really where we allow ourselves to love and then to be loved. And those loving moments can be anywhere and everywhere and not these big prom posals, declarations <laughs> of romantic love. And you never know what seemingly little moment of love, how that seemingly little moment of love is going to impact a person. And that's definitely what I see and think of, you know, from this trip, the, the intervention that my freshman friends had that moment of love, they didn't even know, they probably didn't even remember until I brought it up again. In fact, my friend Kathleen said, as I was recounting it, she's like, yes, I remember. And she started to cry again, but taking those moments of love, you have no idea what the, the impact is or could be the little moments of love that my mentors uh, had and took the time with me to help carry me, lift me, um, guide me, be my North star. Mm -hmm. They didn't know the impact mm -hmm. that they had the impact, you know, um, that Chris and Tina had in my life separately and then combined as a couple. And then the impact of receiving or not receiving um, <laughs> gifts. And then yes, the impact um, that I know I haven't articulated enough, but how could I ever articulate enough um, to my parents for the sacrifices that uh, they have made for me to have the life that I have? Take those chances in those loving moments to, to give love, receive love, express love, and be grateful for all of the above. Because you're worthy of love and you're worthy of love because you are not just simply enough. You are more than enough. Just as you are. Period. Period. Mm, I love you. Love you too. <laughs> 